A gunman walking into an Oregon high school, heading straight for that locker room, opening fire, killing one student, others running for cover. With a breaking news update on the shooting at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. That shooting leaving two people dead and four wounded. Hey, the plan on the phone. Let's go. The Uvalde school shooting, which occurred on May 24, 2022, at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, resulted in the tragic deaths of 19 young students and two teachers. This event has been subjected to extensive analysis, revealing systemic failures in law enforcement response, training, and protocols. An analysis by the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training Program highlighted several critical issues, including a failure to immediately engage the shooter which is contrary to protocols developed after the 1999 Columbine High School massacre. Officers were advised that in active shooter situations, the primary objective should be to neutralize the threat immediately. However, during the Uvalde incident, there was a significant delay of 77 minutes before law enforcement confronted and neutralized the shooter. This delay occurred despite the presence of officers on the scene and the shooter firing multiple shots in their presence, clearly indicating an ongoing threat. Further complicating the response was the lack of clear leadership and coordination among the numerous law enforcement officers present from various agencies. Over 380 officers from 24 local, county, state, and federal agencies arrived on the scene, yet none established an incident command structure, resulting in confusion and a lack of timely action. This absence of leadership and coordination, coupled with weak communication and misinformation, significantly undermined the response effort. The U.S. Department of Justice's report on the incident criticized the response for treating the situation as a barricaded subject scenario rather than an active shooter event, which led to critical delays in confronting the shooter. It also highlighted failures in communication and leadership, as well as inadequate technology and training among the responding officers. The report emphasized that the victims and survivors deserved better and pointed out that immediate action to breach the classroom could have saved lives. The DOJ's findings are part of a broader critique of the increasing challenge law enforcement faces with active shooter situations, especially as officers are often not as extensively trained for combat situations as military personnel. This lack of preparedness combined with the availability of military-grade weapons to civilians creates a significant challenge in effectively responding to such incidents. In response to these findings, there have been calls for improved training, leadership, and coordination among law enforcement agencies. Recommendations include the need for more comprehensive active shooter response protocols, better communication systems that work in critical environments, and leadership training to ensure effective incident command during emergencies. The Uvalde school shooting has therefore become a focal point for examining law enforcement's preparedness and response to active shooter situations, highlighting the urgent need for systemic changes to prevent such tragic outcomes in the future. The Nashville school shooting, which took place at the Covenant School, has become a focal point for discussions on school safety, law enforcement response, and societal reactions to such tragedies. This shooting was particularly notable for the rapid response of law enforcement compared to other incidents. Nashville police were able to neutralize the shooter, Audrey Elizabeth Hale, within 14 minutes of receiving the 911 call, highlighting the importance of swift action in active shooter situations. The shooter, identified as a trans man, had meticulously planned the attack, including conducting reconnaissance and creating a detailed map of the school. Despite the shooter's extensive preparations, which included a manifesto and evidence of hate-filled language, law enforcement's quick response likely prevented further casualties. The shooting resulted in the tragic loss of three children and three school staff members. The incident sparked a national debate on gun control, school safety, and the role of mental health in such tragedies. It led to protests and calls for legislative action, both locally and nationally, with thousands rallying for stricter gun control laws. In response, Tennessee's legislature passed bills to improve safety measures in schools, including funding for school resource officers and safety enhancements. The Nashville school shooting underscores the need for comprehensive approaches to prevent future tragedies, including better mental health support, effective law enforcement training and response protocols, and meaningful legislation. The community's response, including vigils, memorials, and benefit concerts, reflects the collective mourning and solidarity in the face of such violence, while also igniting a push for systemic change to ensure the safety of children in schools.
The Oxford High School shooting, a devastating event that took the lives of four students and injured several others, has been meticulously analyzed to understand the factors leading up to it and to identify preventative measures. Law enforcement's swift action in apprehending the shooter within minutes of their arrival likely prevented further tragedy, underscoring the importance of rapid response during such critical incidents. Investigations into the shooting, notably by Guidepost Solutions, revealed systemic failures and a preventable tragedy had the school district properly implemented its threat assessment and suicide intervention protocols. A glaring oversight was the lack of familiarity among the school's staff with the district's threat assessment policies, and there was confusion over who was responsible for conducting these assessments. This failure was primarily attributed to the district's superintendent, who did not ensure that administrators were aware of or followed the district's policies. A significant concern highlighted in the aftermath was the absence of a plan for monitoring over 90 security cameras within the school during emergencies. This gap in preparedness meant that there was no real-time information available on the shooter's location, a critical element in managing the school's safety during the attack. The community's response to the tragedy included legal action, with the shooter's parents being charged with involuntary manslaughter for their role in failing to prevent the attack, marking a notable attempt to hold family members accountable. The community also pushed for an independent investigation into the school's handling of the incident, emphasizing the need for transparency and accountability from school officials. The Oxford High School shooting highlights the multifaceted nature of school violence prevention, including the importance of clear and effective threat assessment policies, the role of law enforcement and school administrations in emergency preparedness, and the broader societal challenges that contribute to such tragic events. The Kazan school shooting on May 11, 2021, marked a tragic event in the city of Kazan, Tatarstan, Russia, where a 19-year-old former student, Ilnaz Galyaviev, launched a deadly attack on Gymnasia. Galyaviev killed nine people, including seven students and two teachers, and injured 23 others. Before the attack, he posted a chilling message on Telegram, indicating his intent to kill and referring to his victims as bio-waste. Galyaviev, who had been expelled from a college in Kazan and had no previous criminal record, had legally acquired a semi-automatic shotgun and researched bomb-making online. He was detained shortly after the attack and underwent psychological and psychiatric evaluations, which ultimately found him sane. Galyaviev was sentenced to life imprisonment in a special regime colony on April 13, 2023. The shooting prompted a national conversation in Russia about how to prevent such incidents, with some officials calling for increased state control and others suggesting that the government's own actions and rhetoric might contribute to a culture of violence. Proposals were made to restrict internet anonymity and enhance state involvement in children's activities outside of school hours. Concerns were also raised about the potential misuse of security measures, with surveillance technology being used to identify and punish anti-government demonstrators rather than to ensure public safety. In the aftermath, President Vladimir Putin ordered the government to tighten the country's gun laws, and discussions ensued about increasing the restrictions on obtaining gun licenses. The tragedy also led to financial support for the victims' families, with significant amounts of money being raised and distributed to those affected. The Kazan School shooting highlights the complex interplay of individual mental health issues, societal influences, and the availability of firearms and bomb-making information. It underscores the challenges of preventing such tragedies through legislative and security measures alone, pointing to the need for a multifaceted approach that includes addressing the underlying societal and psychological factors. The 2023 Prague shooting, a tragic event that unfolded at Charles University's Faculty of Arts, is marked as the deadliest mass shooting in the Czech Republic's history. On December 21, 2023, a 24-year-old Czech student identified as David Kozak embarked on a rampage that claimed the lives of 14 individuals, including his own father, and left 25 others wounded. Kozak's attack commenced after he fatally shot his father in Hostun before proceeding to Prague, where he targeted the university. In the hours leading up to the attack, police discovered a connection between Kozak and the Klanovich Forest murders, revealing a more extensive history of violence. Despite earlier police efforts to track down Kozak for previous crimes, they were unable to prevent the university attack due to regional jurisdictional challenges. The shooting prompted a national day of mourning on December 23rd, with the Czech Republic pausing to remember the victims. Ceremonies including a mass at St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague Castle were held reflecting the profound impact of the tragedy on the nation. The incident has sparked discussions on security, gun control, 
and the influence of societal and cultural factors on such acts of violence, the Czech Republic, known for relatively relaxed gun laws and a high rate of legal firearm ownership, now faces calls for reflection on how to balance freedom and safety in preventing future tragedies. As investigations continue, there is a significant focus on understanding Kozak's motivations and the circumstances that led to such a devastating act. The event has not only shaken the Czech Republic but also prompted international condolences and support, underlining the global concern over increasing instances of mass shootings. This tragic event underscores the urgent need for comprehensive approaches to tackle the root causes of mass shootings, including mental health support, effective law enforcement strategies, and responsible gun ownership regulations. The Prague University shooting serves as a somber reminder of the potential consequences of failing to address these complex issues in a timely and effective manner. The tragic event at Vladislav Ribnikar Model Elementary School in Belgrade, Serbia, on May 3, 2023, marked one of the country's most devastating incidents of school violence. A 13-year-old student, Kosta Kekmanovic, embarked on a shooting spree, resulting in the deaths of 10 individuals including 9 students and 1 security guard, and injuring 6 others. This attack not only shocked the nation but also led to significant legal and societal repercussions. Kikmanovic, due to his age, was deemed not criminally responsible under Serbian law and has since been confined to a mental institution. However, the legal focus shifted towards his parents, who faced charges related to their alleged failure to secure the firearm and ammunition used in the tragic incident, highlighting the responsibilities of gun ownership and parental oversight. The broader impact of the shooting extended beyond the immediate legal implications. In response to this and another mass shooting that occurred in central Serbia the following day, there were widespread protests against President Aleksandar Vucic. Critics accused him of fostering a culture of violence in a country still grappling with the legacy of the 1990s conflicts. These events have sparked a national conversation on gun control, school safety, and the societal factors contributing to such acts of violence in a country known for one of the highest rates of gun ownership globally. The Belgrade school shooting serves as a stark reminder of the complex interplay between individual actions, familial responsibilities, and broader societal and cultural dynamics. It underscores the urgent need for comprehensive approaches to address school violence including mental health support, secure and responsible gun ownership, and the cultivation of a culture of non-violence. The Perm State University shooting, which occurred on September 20, 2021 in Perm, Russia, resulted in six fatalities and 48 injuries, including the perpetrator. The assailant, 18-year-old Timur Bekmansurov, initiated the attack with a Huglu Atrox T-12 gauge pump-action shotgun, and his motive was attributed to misanthropy. The incident transpired approximately four months after another tragic school shooting in Kazan, Russia. Despite legislative efforts to increase the legal age for gun purchases from 18 to 21 in response to school shootings, this law had not taken effect at the time of the perm shooting. Authorities have often attributed the influence of foreign school shootings, particularly those in the United States, as a factor in these incidents. Witness accounts describe the brutality of the attack, highlighting the chaos and fear experienced by students and staff. The university, home to around 12,000 students, had only 3,000 individuals on campus during the incident. Security footage captured the gunman overpowering a security guard before entering the university premises and beginning his rampage. Students and teachers barricaded themselves in classrooms to escape the gunfire, while others fled the building through windows. Six victims, ranging in age from 18 to 66, lost their lives, and dozens more were wounded in the attack. Beckman Surov, who was a law student at the university, had legally owned the shotgun used in the shooting. Prior to the attack, he had posted images of himself armed on social media expressing his long-contemplated plans and his state of overflowing hate. The aftermath of the shooting saw the community and students of Perm State University come together to mourn and honor the victims, creating a makeshift memorial at the university's exterior fence. This tragedy has sparked further discussions on gun control and safety measures in educational institutions across Russia. This incident is a stark reminder of the global issue of school shootings, highlighting the need for comprehensive approaches to mental health, gun control, and security in educational settings to prevent such tragedies in the future. On November 20, 2006, an incident of school violence unfolded at Geschwister Schule in Emsdetten, Germany, involving 18-year-old former student Sebastian Bassa. Bassa injured eight individuals and ignited multiple smoke bombs before taking his own life. 
This event momentarily stood as Germany's gravest school shooting since the Erfurt Massacre until it was surpassed by the 2009 Winnenden tragedy, which resulted in 16 fatalities. Details of the incident reveal that Bossy arrived at the school around 9.20 a.m., dressed in a long black trench coat and a gas mask. He commenced his assault in the schoolyard, initially injuring the school janitor with gunfire and a female teacher with a smoke bomb. Despite the police's swift response, navigating the smoke-filled school proved challenging, culminating in their discovery of Boss's body approximately 38 minutes after their arrival. In total, the attack left one dead and 37 injured, with victims suffering from gunshot wounds and smoke inhalation, among other injuries. Bossa, who graduated from the school earlier that year, was found to have an extensive arsenal, including firearms and explosives, some of which were acquired through online transactions. Investigations into his motives revealed a deep-seated frustration with societal norms and personal grievances, as expressed in his writings and online posts. Bossy's actions were premeditated, evident from his diary entries and internet activities, including requests for psychological help and the posting of bomb-making videos. In the aftermath, the incident reignited debates in Germany over the regulation of violent video games, prompting changes in the rating system for computer games. This tragic event highlights the complex interplay of personal, societal, and regulatory factors in the context of school violence. The 2019 STEM School Highlands Ranch shooting occurred on May 7, 2019, in Douglas County, Colorado. The attack was carried out by two students of the school, 18-year-old Devin Michael Erickson and 16-year-old transgender boy Alec McKinney. The incident resulted in the tragic death of 18-year-old Kendrick Castillo and left eight other students injured. Erickson and McKinney, who had accessed firearms from a gun safe belonging to one of their parents, were motivated by a desire for revenge against their peers. The planning of the attack was revealed to have taken place over several weeks, with McKinney expressing a desire for the students at the school to experience bad things and suffer trauma as he had in his life due to bullying related to his gender identity. On the day of the shooting, the attackers entered the school through a door where they knew they could avoid detection. The incident quickly escalated to violence, with Erickson and McKinney opening fire in a classroom containing students they specifically targeted. Erickson was subdued by fellow students, including Kendrick Castillo, who heroically rushed him during the attack. McKinney was also confronted by individuals in the classroom but managed to escape, only to be apprehended shortly after. The legal proceedings following the attack saw Erickson and McKinney charged with multiple criminal counts, including first-degree murder. McKinney pleaded guilty to 17 charges as part of a plea bargain and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years. Erickson's trial concluded with him being convicted on 46 counts, resulting in a life sentence without parole plus an additional 1,282 years. The shooting prompted a strong response from the community, political figures, and the nation. In the aftermath, President Donald Trump and other officials issued statements offering condolences and acknowledging the bravery of the first responders and students like Kendrick Castillo. The tragedy also ignited discussions on gun control, school safety, and the need for supportive measures for victims of such violent acts. The Concordia University massacre, which occurred on August 24, 1992, was a tragic event where Valeri Fabricant, an associate professor of mechanical engineering, opened fire at the university, resulting in the deaths of four colleagues and the wounding of a staff member. This incident took place at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Fabricant, who was convicted of murder, is currently serving a life sentence. An in-depth analysis revealed that warning signs of Fabricant's potential for violence were evident, but were unfortunately overlooked by university administrators. His actions culminated in the deaths of departmental chair Foivos Ziogas and professors Matthew Douglas, Michael Hogben, and Aaron John Saber. The aftermath of the tragedy led to a comprehensive review of Fabricant's employment history and behavioral issues by John Scott Cowan, highlighting systemic problems within academic environments where disruptive behavior is sometimes excused under the guise of academic freedom. In response, Concordia University made several changes to its administrative procedures and ethics rules, aiming to improve the management of faculty and staff, enhance the integrity of scholarship, and prevent such incidents in the future. These changes included the establishment of conflict resolution workshops and the implementation of new rules governing financial accountability and scientific integrity. This tragic event has left a lasting legacy at Concordia University and has prompted discussions on the need for better management and support systems within academic institutions 
to detect and address warning signs of potential violence. The Ijevsk school shooting, which occurred on September 26, 2022, in Ijevsk Udmurtia, Russia, was a devastating event resulting in the deaths of 17 individuals, including 11 children and wounding 24 others. The attacker Artyom Kazantsev, a former student of the school, carried out the attack with two pistols and a significant amount of ammunition. Before the attack, Kazantsev had a history of violent behavior, including a knife attack in 2008. Despite these early warning signs, he was found to be in a state of insanity during those earlier crimes and was not subject to criminal liability. The incident was described by Kremlin Press Secretary Dmitry Peskov as an act of terrorism potentially linked to a neo-fascist group. This event prompted a widespread response from both national leaders, including Russian President Vladimir Putin and Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin, and international figures like Chinese President Xi Jinping. The global community expressed condolences to the victims' families and condemned the act of violence. In the aftermath, spontaneous memorials were organized in various cities, reflecting the deep impact of the tragedy on the Russian community and beyond. The shooter's motivations were reportedly not related to terrorism, as indicated in an email he sent 20 minutes before the shooting. However, the exact motives remain complex, with reports suggesting Kazantsev's possible affiliation with neo-fascist ideologies. This tragic event has been analyzed in the context of the Columbine effect, indicating a possible inspiration from previous school shootings. The Ijevsk school shooting is part of a troubling pattern of school-related violence that has affected many countries worldwide. It underscores the need for vigilant security measures in educational institutions and the importance of addressing the root causes of such violence, including mental health issues and the influence of extremist ideologies. And we've now seen for the first time that surveillance image of the suspected shooter. Live picture of Seattle Pacific Campus. Uh, there has been a shooting there. The Seattle Fire Department says it is uh, considering it a multi-casualty incident. <laughs> A college campus was the scene of yet another deadly mass shooting today. On February 13th, 2023, Michigan State University in East Lansing experienced a tragic mass shooting across two campus locations leading to the deaths of three students and injuries to five others. The shooter, identified as 43-year-old Anthony Dwayne McRae, later took his own life after being confronted by police off campus. This tragic event prompted MSU to cancel classes for the week and relocate courses from the affected buildings for the semester's duration. In response, students and supporters rallied at the Michigan State Capitol advocating for gun control reforms. The attack began when McRae, after arriving at MSU by bus, embarked on a violent spree starting at Berkey Hall and then moving to the MSU Union Building. The shootings claimed the lives of students Ariel Anderson, Alexandria Werner, and Brian Fraser, with several others sustaining injuries. The incident sparked a massive law enforcement response and a campus-wide lockdown, urging students to run, hide, and fight. McRae, who had no direct ties to MSU, was found with legally purchased but unregistered firearms along with a significant amount of ammunition. Despite a prior misdemeanor for carrying a weapon without a license, McRae's legal ability to possess firearms had been restored after his probation ended. The aftermath of the shooting saw the community mourning, with MSU offering counseling services and modifying academic policies to accommodate affected students. Vigils and memorials were held, and a significant push for gun control legislation was initiated by MSU students and supporters, culminating in protests at the Michigan State Capitol. The tragedy also led to renewed discussions on gun control, with proposed legislation aiming to address the issue following similar incidents at Oxford High School and other schools nationwide. The Seattle Pacific University shooting on June 5, 2014, was a harrowing event that left one student dead and two others injured. The perpetrator, 27-year-old Aaron Ibarra from Mount Lake Terrace, had no direct connection to the university but carried out the attack after planning and scouting the campus. Ibarra was armed with a shotgun and additional ammunition, and his attack began outside Otto Miller Hall, where he fatally shot student Paul Lee and injured others. The shooting was halted thanks to the brave actions of John Mace, a student security guard who tackled Ibarra while he was reloading his shotgun. 
Mace's quick thinking and courage prevented further tragedy. Following the incident, the university community came together to grieve and support one another, demonstrating the importance of unity in the face of such violence. The event led to discussions on campus safety, emergency preparedness, and the need for communities to support each other during crises. Cheryl Michaels from the Justice Clearinghouse highlighted the importance of having a well-thought-out emergency response plan and the value of communication and community support in the aftermath of such incidents. She emphasized that while it's crucial to have immediate life safety response components in place, the ability to adapt and respond to unforeseen challenges is equally important. This tragic event is a stark reminder of the potential for violence in educational settings and the critical need for preparedness and swift action to protect lives. It also underscores the profound impact of individual acts of bravery and the collective healing power of community support in the aftermath of violence. The 2019 University of North Carolina at Charlotte shooting, which took place on April 30th, highlighted the tragic reality of campus shootings that align with broader patterns seen in mass shootings across the United States. The incident resulted in the death of two students, Ellis Parlier and Riley Howell, with four others injured, demonstrating the devastating impact such events have on the campus community and beyond. The response to the shooting was swift, with the Charlotte Fire Department and ambulances arriving on scene minutes after the incident began, and the perpetrator, Tristan A. Terrell, a former student, was quickly apprehended by law enforcement. The university and broader community rallied to support the victims and their families, reflecting a strong sense of unity and resilience in the face of such tragedy. This shooting shares characteristics common to other campus shootings, including its occurrence at a large public university and at a time of high stress for students at the end of the academic year. The profile of the shooter as a young, former student also mirrors patterns seen in other campus shootings, where individuals often have histories of trauma, mental illness, and previous violence. These insights emphasize the need for proactive strategies to identify and support vulnerable students, enhance mental health care, and implement preventive measures such as threat assessment teams and red flag laws. The aftermath of the shooting at UNC Charlotte and others like it underscores the critical importance of preparedness, rapid response, and community support in managing such crises. It also highlights the ongoing need for research and resources to better understand and prevent campus shootings ensuring the safety and well-being of students and staff across educational institutions. The 2023 University of Nevada, Las Vegas shooting tragically resulted in the deaths of three faculty members and left one other faculty member seriously injured. The faculty members who lost their lives were identified as Patricia Navarro Velez, an accounting professor, Chajan Chong, an MIS professor, and Naoko Takamaru, who oversaw UNLV's Japanese Studies program. The incident prompted the university to establish a reunification center, cancel in-person classes for the remainder of 2023, and significantly impacted the community and campus activities. In response to the shooting, UNLV took immediate actions to ensure the safety and support of its students and staff. Classes were canceled for the rest of the week following the incident, and discussions on how to proceed with finals and other campus activities were initiated. The broader Las Vegas community, including local authorities and institutions like the College of Southern Nevada, also responded to the tragedy with closures and modifications to scheduled events. The suspect identified in the shooting was Anthony Polito, a 67-year-old individual with a history of applying for jobs at several Nevada higher education institutions without success. Polito had a list of individuals he was targeting at the UNLV campus, as well as at East Carolina University. The motive behind the shooting remains under investigation, although it was noted that Polito had expressed grievances related to his employment applications and had previously sent letters to UNLV personnel across the country. This tragic event at UNLV underscores the ongoing challenge of ensuring safety on campuses across the country. It reflects broader patterns seen in campus shootings, such as the occurrence towards the end of the academic year, a time often marked by heightened stress among students. The incident also highlights the importance of proactive measures and support systems to address potential threats and ensure the well-being of the university community. The 2006 shooting at Orange High School in North Carolina, carried out by Alvaro Castillo, resulted in the injury of two students and the tragic death of his father prior to the attack at the school. Castillo, who was 22 at the time of his trial, was found guilty on multiple charges including first-degree murder and assault with a deadly weapon, 
leading to a life sentence without parole. Castillo's actions were influenced by his obsession with the Columbine High School shooting and were driven by a complex mixture of mental health issues, as highlighted by his defense claiming insanity due to diagnoses of schizotypal and obsessive-compulsive personality disorders, along with major depressive disorder. The incident, which concluded when school personnel tackled Castillo, sparked discussions on mental health, school safety, and the significance of early intervention to prevent such tragedies. Despite Castillo's later expression of remorse, stating that he now realized his actions were wrong, the lasting impact on the victims, the school community, and the broader discourse on gun violence in educational settings remains profound. The Bryansk school shooting on December 7, 2023 was a tragic event in Bryansk, Russia, where a 14-year-old student, Alina Afanaskina, carried out a mass shooting at gymnasium. The incident resulted in the death of one student and injuries to five others before Afanaskina committed suicide. The shooting began in a biology classroom on the fourth floor, causing immediate evacuation and shock among students and staff. Afanaskina had concealed a Bekas III shotgun belonging to her father and brought a knife to school managing to bypass security measures due to malfunctioning metal detectors. Investigations revealed that Afanaskina had been subjected to bullying since elementary school and had conflicts with other students at the Bryansk school. Among the personal items found at the crime scene were a backpack, a box of cartridges, and notes indicating Afanaskina's troubled state of mind. The Russian investigative committee has opened a criminal case to probe the incident further, and Afanaskina's father has been detained under charges related to negligence and incitement to suicide. This incident is part of a worrying trend of school shootings in Russia, which had been relatively rare until 2021. Following a series of shootings in Kazan and Perm, Russian lawmakers tightened gun control laws, raising the minimum age for acquiring hunting rifles and enhancing mental health checks. However, this tragedy underscores the need for continued vigilance and preventative measures to protect students and staff in educational institutions. The Aracruz school shootings on November 25, 2022, in Espirito Santo, Brazil, marked a tragic incident where Gabriel Rodriguez Castiglione, a 16-year-old former student, embarked on a shooting spree across two schools, resulting in four fatalities and 12 injuries. The attack commenced around 9.30 a.m. and spanned two educational institutions located on the same street, Castiglione, donning military camouflage, a swastika armband, a skull mask, and a bucket hat forcibly entered the Primo Bidi Elementary and Middle School by breaking a lock and shot 11 individuals, leading to the death of two teachers immediately and another the following day. Subsequently, he targeted the educational center Praia de Coqueral, a private school killing a female sixth grade student. The aftermath saw the city of Aracruz suspending all classes at municipal schools, reflecting the profound impact on the community. This event prompted statements of solidarity and grief from political figures, including President-elect Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who expressed his condolences over this absurd tragedy on social media. Governor Renato Casagrande, during a press conference, revealed that Castiglione had been a student at the first targeted school until June 2022 and was undergoing psychiatric treatment, suggesting a complex background to the assailant's motives. Notably, the firearms used in the attack, a 40 semi-automatic handgun and a 38 revolver, were registered to the perpetrator's father, a military police officer, adding another layer of tragedy to the incident. The Aracruz school shootings are part of a concerning trend of increased school violence in Brazil, contrasting with the country's history where such incidents were relatively rare. The attacks have spurred discussions on school safety, the influence of extremist ideologies, and the role of gun control in preventing future tragedies. This incident underscores the urgent need for comprehensive strategies to address the root causes of school shootings, including mental health support, community engagement, and effective law enforcement protocols to ensure the safety and security of educational environments. The 2008 Jerusalem Yeshiva attack occurred on March 6 at the Merkaz Harav Yeshiva, a religious seminary in Jerusalem. A Palestinian gunman, Allah Abu Daim, entered the yeshiva and began shooting, resulting in eight students killed and 11 more wounded, with five of those in serious to critical condition. The attack, which began around 8.36 p.m., ended approximately 20 minutes later when an off-duty Israel Defense Forces officer, David Shapira, fatally shot the terrorist. The assailant Abu Daim was a resident of Jerusalem and reportedly had been a driver who delivered goods to the yeshiva. 
His family described him as intensely religious but not affiliated with any militant group. He had access to Israeli areas as he carried an Israeli identity card, a common status for Arab residents of East Jerusalem who opt not to have Israeli citizenship. The Israeli High Court of Justice later authorized the demolition of Abu Daim's family home. Although Abu Daim did not leave behind a statement detailing his motives, his sister suggested that he had been radicalized by the violence in Gaza. The timing of the attack appeared to send a message that Israeli actions in Gaza, Lebanon, or Syria would not go unanswered, especially as the yeshiva is connected with the leadership of the Jewish settlement movement in the West Bank. Claims of responsibility were ambiguous, with Hezbollah's Al-Manar TV suggesting a group called Galilee Liberators Brigades claimed the attack, while Hamas praised the attack but did not officially claim responsibility. The reaction within Israel was one of horror and mourning, with Prime Minister Ehud Olmert calling the attack horrible and the nation observing traditions of mourning for the victims. The attack led to a mix of grief and anger, with calls for the demolition of the mourning tent for the killer and his family's home. Additionally, it sparked discussions on security, vigilance against revenge attacks, and the broader implications for Israeli-Palestinian relations. This tragic event underscores the complex interplay of religious, nationalistic, and political tensions in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, reflecting on the broader issues of security, identity, and the cycles of violence affecting the region. The 1997 Bethel Regional High School shooting in Bethel, Alaska, stands as a profound tragedy, reflecting the complex interplay of personal turmoil and the potential for violence in educational settings. On February 19, 1997, 16-year-old Evan Ramsey, armed with a 12-gauge shotgun, opened fire in the school lobby just before classes began, resulting in the deaths of Principal Ron Edwards and student Josh Palacios, while also wounding others. The attack, which unfolded over approximately 15 minutes, marked a moment of immense grief and loss for the community. Evan Ramsey's actions were influenced by a tumultuous personal life, including a history of family violence and instability. His father, Don Ramsey, had previously engaged in a shooting incident at the Anchorage Times newspaper in 1986 due to a grievance with the publisher, which ended without physical harm to others. Evan's mother's struggle with alcoholism and the subsequent cycle of foster care for Evan and his siblings further compounded his sense of isolation and distress. Despite a brief period of perceived stability under the guardianship of the Lower Kuskokwim School District Superintendent, Ramsey struggled with bullying at school, contributing to his decision to carry out the shooting, influenced in part by a hit list created with the help of two friends. In the aftermath, the community of Bethel grappled with the shock and sorrow of the incident, seeking ways to remember the victims and prevent future tragedies. The story of Josh Palacios, a beloved high school basketball star, and the enduring grief of his mother, Claudia Palacios, underscores the lasting impact of school shootings on families and communities. Claudia's journey through loss to forgiveness highlights the profound personal and communal challenges faced in the wake of such violence. This tragic event underscores the critical importance of addressing the root causes of violence in schools including the need for comprehensive support systems for students facing personal and family challenges. It also highlights the necessity of community resilience and forgiveness in the process of healing and prevention of future tragedies. The tragic incident involving the killing of Kayla Rowland at Buell Elementary School in Mount Morris Township, Michigan, near Flint on February 29, 2000, remains one of the most heart-wrenching examples of gun violence in American schools. Kayla Rowland, a six-year-old first grader, was fatally shot by her classmate, Dedrick Owens, also six years old, marking a deeply disturbing event due to the very young ages of both the victim and the perpetrator. The aftermath of the shooting revealed a complex web of contributing factors, including the unsafe living environment of the shooter. Dedrick Owens had access to the firearm used in the shooting through his uncle, Jamel James, who negligently stored the 32 caliber pistol in a shoebox in his bedroom. This oversight led to James being sentenced for involuntary manslaughter, highlighting the critical importance of responsible gun ownership and storage. In the years following the tragedy, Kayla's mother, Veronica McQueen, became a staunch advocate for stricter gun control, emphasizing the need for policy changes to prevent future tragedies of this nature. Her advocacy work underscores the ongoing debate surrounding gun control laws and the measures necessary to protect children in school settings. This incident and the public and policy responses to it exemplify the devastating impact of gun violence in schools and the urgent need for comprehensive strategies to address the root causes. 
It also highlights the significance of community and familial responsibility in ensuring the safety and well-being of children. On January 4th, 2024, Perry High School in Perry, Iowa, witnessed a tragic mass shooting carried out by 17-year-old transgender student Dylan Butler. The incident resulted in the deaths of five students and three staff members, including one student who passed away on the same day, and the school principal, Dan Marburger, who succumbed to his injuries 10 days later. This event marked the first school shooting of the year. Perry High School, alongside Perry Middle School, constitutes the Perry Community School District. Both schools are housed in the same building and are connected by a hallway near the cafeteria, the site of the shooting, which also serves as a venue for a breakfast program for students. Dylan Butler, identified as the shooter, was known to be a quiet individual who had faced bullying for an extended period. His actions raised concerns regarding the school's intervention policies, especially following reports of his younger sister being bullied. The means through which Butler acquired the firearms as a minor remains under investigation, and his motive for the shooting has not been disclosed. However, Butler's social media activity, including a concerning TikTok post before the event, hinted at premeditation. The shooting commenced early in the morning during the breakfast session, prompting immediate responses from law enforcement and emergency services. Principal Marburger's attempt to engage Butler is credited with helping students escape. The scene was secured by police who discovered Butler deceased from a self-inflicted gunshot, alongside a pump-action shotgun, a handgun, and a homemade bomb which was safely disarmed. The community quickly mobilized support for the victims, with memorials held and fundraising initiatives launched to assist those impacted. The incident drew widespread attention, prompting statements of condolence and calls for action on gun violence from various political figures and organizations, including the White House. This tragic event has reignited discussions on school safety, gun control, and the broader issue of violence in educational settings. The 2019 Saugus High School shooting in Santa Clarita, California, was a devastating event that unfolded on November 14th when Nathaniel Bearhow, a 16-year-old student at the school, opened fire with a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol in the school's quad area. Bearhow shot five fellow students, fatally wounding two, before turning the gun on himself. The tragic incident resulted in the deaths of a 16-year-old girl and a 14-year-old boy, with Bearhow dying from his self-inflicted gunshot wound the following day. The shooting, occurring on Bearhow's 16th birthday, was over in just 16 seconds, highlighting the rapid and unpredictable nature of such violent acts. Berhau was described by fellow students as quiet and seemed like a regular kid, which adds to the complexity of understanding the motives behind such tragedies. The investigation revealed Berhau had grown up around firearms and had been taught to use them responsibly. However, the handgun used in the shooting was a ghost gun, a privately made firearm assembled from parts without serial numbers complicating efforts to trace the weapon's origins and raising concerns about gun regulation loopholes. The aftermath of the shooting saw the community come together to offer support and grief counseling, demonstrating resilience in the face of tragedy. The event prompted political responses from figures including President Donald Trump and then-Senator Kamala Harris, with discussions on gun control and school safety measures being brought to the forefront. The Sagu's high school shooting is a stark reminder of the need for comprehensive strategies to prevent future school shootings, including tighter gun control laws, improved mental health support, and effective school safety protocols. The Sagu's high school tragedy also underscores the ongoing challenge of ensuring the safety of students in schools across the United States, highlighting the importance of community and political action in addressing the root causes of school shootings. Now to the school shooting in Perry, Iowa. Police saying multiple people were shot at the local high school early this morning on the student's first day back to class. How could a six-year-old get a gun, then shoot another human being? The city of Santa Clarita, California, just north of Los Angeles, continues to grieve this morning following this week's deadly shooting at Saugus High School. On October 24, 2022, a tragic mass shooting unfolded at Central Visual and Performing Arts High School, located in St. Louis, Missouri's Southwest Garden area. The assailant, a 19-year-old ex-student, unleashed gunfire on the school community, resulting in two deaths and seven injuries before police intervention ended his rampage. The institution had established security measures including metal detectors and employed seven security guards. Despite these precautions, 
Missouri's lack of red flag laws, which allow for the temporary removal of firearms from individuals deemed a threat, underscored a significant gap in preventive measures. The shooter, Orlando Harris, executed his attack with a high level of premeditation, including a stockpile of ammunition and detailed planning evident from materials found in his possession. His entry into the school was marked by violence as he shot through a glass door to gain access, and his actions inside were of a person intent on causing maximum harm. The swift response of the school's security personnel and the police was crucial in mitigating further tragedy. Their actions led to the shooter's confrontation and subsequent neutralization within minutes of their arrival. The event also prompted a lockdown and evacuation of students, including those from a neighboring school within the same building. The casualties of this senseless act were Alexandria Bell, a 15-year-old student, and John Kuchka, a 61-year-old physical education teacher. The aftermath saw the injured receiving medical attention, with some suffering from severe injuries due to the chaos. Investigations into the incident revealed Harris's struggles with mental health, his isolation, and a history of being denied a firearm purchase through legal channels. This did not, however, prevent him from acquiring the weapon used in the attack through a private sale, highlighting loopholes in gun ownership laws. The incident drew widespread condemnation and reignited the debate on gun control measures, with the White House, President Joe Biden, and Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona expressing their grief and calling for legislative action. Local officials and community members rallied for change, emphasizing the urgent need for enhanced safety protocols and gun laws. This event not only cast a spotlight on the existing vulnerabilities in school safety and gun legislation, but also prompted a collective call to action to prevent future tragedies. The W.R. Myers High School shooting on April 28, 1999 in Tabor, Alberta, Canada, marked a somber moment in Canadian history being the first fatal high school shooting in the country in over two decades. The perpetrator, 14-year-old Todd Cameron Smith, entered the school armed with a 22 caliber Ruger 10-22 semi-automatic rifle and 375 rounds of ammunition. The attack resulted in the death of 17-year-old Jason Lang and the injury of another student. Smith was subdued by gym coach Chano Finney and arrested by a local constable without further incident. The incident highlighted issues of bullying, with Smith having suffered severe bullying throughout his school years, contributing to his actions. Despite the trauma and challenges following the incident, the community and individuals directly affected, like Shane Christmas, who survived being shot, have worked towards forgiveness and understanding. Christmas mentioned that the event still affects every aspect of his adult life, but has found it within himself to forgive the gunman. In the aftermath, Smith faced legal proceedings under Canada's Young Offenders Act, receiving a sentence that reflected his status as a juvenile. He was sentenced to three years in prison, followed by seven years of probation. This case brought attention to the need for mental health supports for students and a conversation around bullying in schools. The shooting remains a poignant reminder of the impacts of school violence and the importance of community resilience and support in the wake of such tragedies. On October 10, 2007, the Success Tech Academy, an alternative high school in Cleveland, Ohio, became the site of a tragic school shooting perpetrated by 14-year-old freshman Asa H. Kuhn. Kuhn, armed with two handguns and additional ammunition, as well as three folding knives, embarked on a violent spree that resulted in the shooting of two students and two teachers before he ended his own life on the school's fourth floor. Before the violence erupted, Kuhn, dressed in a Marilyn Manson concert shirt and black jeans, prepared for his assault in the men's restroom by loading his revolvers. The confrontation began when Kuhn was punched by another student, Michael Peake, leading to Peake being shot in the abdomen. The altercation and subsequent shootings unfolded on the fourth floor, where Kuhn also wounded 17-year-old Darnell Rogers, social studies teacher Michael Grassi, and teacher David Kachadorian. The incident concluded with Kuhn committing suicide in a classroom. The immediate response to the shooting was a code blue lockdown of the school. The victims included the two aforementioned students and two teachers, who received medical treatment for their injuries at local hospitals. An additional student was hospitalized due to injuries sustained in the chaos of the evacuation. Kuhn's actions were reportedly influenced by a combination of personal grievances and experiences at school. He had been suspended prior to the shooting over a dispute related to religious beliefs and was known to have been bullied for his gothic appearance and unique behavior. His academic frustrations and previous threats of violence were also noted by students and teachers alike. Records indicate that Kuhn had a history of criminal behavior and mental health issues dating back to 2005. In the aftermath of the shooting, Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson announced measures to enhance school security across the district, 
including the implementation of metal detectors and additional armed security personnel. The district also established a hotline for reporting threats. The leakage of a crime scene photo led to controversy and disciplinary action against a police officer involved. The Success Tech Academy shooting left a lasting impact on the community, prompting discussions on school safety, mental health, and the importance of addressing bullying and violence in educational settings. On the morning of October 20th, 2017, a 14-year-old student at the private Goiases School in Goiania, Brazil, used a 40 caliber Taurus PT-100 pistol to shoot at his classmates, resulting in two fatalities and four injuries. The student, motivated by a fascination with Adolf Hitler and influenced by previous school shootings like Columbine and Realengo, attempted suicide but was talked down by a school teacher and subsequently apprehended. The shooting occurred around 11.50 a.m. during a class break. The teenager carrying the pistol in his backpack opened fire in the classroom, killing Juan Pedro Calembo and Juan Vitor Gomez, and leaving four others injured, including a girl who was paralyzed from her injuries. The firearm belonged to his mother, a military police officer, as was his father. The situation was further contained by the school's coordinator, Simone Maulaz Eltedo, who convinced the shooter to surrender in the library, preventing further harm until police arrived and arrested him. The incident drew international attention, leading the Goyas government to declare three days of official mourning. Legal actions quickly followed, with the Public Prosecutor's Office of Goyas recommending the shooter's temporary hospitalization. The court agreed, sentencing him to three years of hospitalization under the statute of the child and adolescent, the maximum sentence allowed. The individual was released in May 2020. The Aarhus University shooting in 1994 where Fleming Nielsen, a 35-year-old former student, killed two female students and injured others before committing suicide, stands out as a significant event in Denmark's history. It is notably the only school shooting in Denmark, marking a rare and tragic instance of such violence in the country. Analysis by Ebrecht and Linda Kilda in 2023 offers a nuanced perspective on this incident, framing it within the broader context of lone actor grievance-fueled violence. This approach shifts away from categorizing violent acts based solely on the perpetrator's apparent affiliations and instead emphasizes understanding the underlying grievances that drive such violence. In the case of the Aarhus University shooting, the analysis suggests that the perpetrator may have been driven by complex, multifaceted motivations rather than fitting neatly into a single category of violent actors. This event is also discussed in the context of emerging discussions around incel-driven violence, highlighting the importance of recognizing the nuanced and often blurred lines between different types of lone actor violence. The Aarhus University shooting, therefore, serves as a critical case study in understanding the spectrum of lone actor violence, illustrating how motivations can be complex and multifaceted. This analysis challenges the utility of rigid typologies for classifying such acts, advocating instead for a more nuanced understanding that can better inform both academic inquiry and practical interventions aimed at preventing similar tragedies in the future. The Raman Mary school shooting, which occurred on January 25, 1989, at the Raman Mary Secondary School in Rauma, Finland, holds the grim distinction of being the first school shooting in Finnish history. A 14-year-old student using a pistol belonging to his father fatally shot two of his classmates. The shooter cited bullying as his motive for the attack. Notably, due to the perpetrator's age being under 15, he did not face any criminal charges for his actions. This tragic event underscores the devastating impact of school bullying and highlights the critical need for effective measures to prevent such violence. Additionally, the legal implications of the shooter's age and the absence of criminal charges in this case raise important questions about how society addresses juvenile offenders and the balance between accountability and rehabilitation. The Rauman Mary school shooting serves as a stark reminder of the potential consequences of unchecked bullying and the importance of fostering a safe and supportive environment in educational institutions. It also marks a significant moment in Finland's history, prompting discussions on gun control, school safety protocols, and the social and psychological support systems needed to prevent similar tragedies. The Pak Fanang school shooting, a tragic event that took place on June 6, 2003, in Nakhonsi Tamarat, Thailand, was a disturbing incident of school violence where a 17-year-old student, Anacha Bunkwan, used a semi-automatic pistol to open fire on his classmates. The shooting resulted in the deaths of two students, Chrysorn Kanchanadol and Juanita Kleobang, 
both 17 years old and injured four others. The motivation behind Bunquan's actions was reportedly an argument with a classmate, Sicharat Kumsuk, who was his intended target. This incident was part of a concerning trend of violence in Thai schools, which was not limited to gang-related activities. In the same month as the Pak Fanong school shooting, Thailand witnessed other instances of schoolyard violence, marking a period of heightened concern over the safety and security of students in educational settings. The reaction to the shooting included a statement from then Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawatra, who described the incident as an emulation of violence seen in Western countries. He emphasized the need to work with the Education Ministry to prevent further school shootings. The incident sparked discussions on the influence of cultural and external factors on youth violence and the measures needed to safeguard students in Thailand. This tragic event underscores the importance of addressing the root causes of violence among youth, including the need for effective conflict resolution strategies, mental health support, and secure educational environments to prevent future tragedies. The 2014 Moscow school shooting, occurring on February 3, 2014, at School No. 263 in the Otradnoi district of Moscow, Russia, marked a tragic event that was unprecedented in Russia's modern history. The shooter, 15-year-old high school student Sergei Gordeyev, armed with a small-caliber rifle and a shotgun belonging to his father, a police colonel, killed a teacher and a police officer, injuring another officer. Gordeyev also took 29 students hostage before eventually surrendering to the authorities. This incident sparked a significant debate on security within educational institutions across Russia and the broader issue of gun control. The event drew comparisons to school shootings in the United States, with discussions highlighting the balance between gun rights and the need for secure educational environments. In the aftermath, Russian authorities and the public alike scrutinized the effectiveness of existing security measures at schools, which had been previously tightened following the Beslan hostage crisis in 2004. However, the unique circumstances of the Moscow shooting, involving a lone shooter within a school setting, underscored different security challenges compared to those posed by organized terrorist attacks. The shooter's motive was initially speculated to be revenge against the geography teacher he killed, but further investigation revealed Gordeyev suffered from an emotional disorder and had no prior conflicts with teachers or fellow students. He harbored solipsistic beliefs, viewing others as illusions, which contributed to his actions that day. A medical examination later confirmed Gordeyev had symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, leading to his sentencing to involuntary treatment in a psychiatric hospital. In reaction to the tragedy, Russian officials, including President Vladimir Putin, emphasized the importance of cultural and educational measures, alongside tightened security to prevent similar incidents. Discussions also touched upon the influence of violent video games and American culture, with some officials suggesting these as contributing factors to the incident. The debate extended to the legislative sphere, with proposals for stricter gun control measures being put forward. This tragic event not only highlighted the need for robust security measures and support systems within schools, but also prompted a broader societal reflection on the causes of such violence and the best approaches to prevent it. The 2013 Sparks Middle School shooting occurred on October 21, 2013, when 12-year-old Jose Reyes opened fire at the school, resulting in the deaths of teacher Michael Lansbury and the shooter himself, Jose Reyes. Two students were wounded in the incident. The tragedy has sparked discussions and analyses regarding bullying, mental health, and gun control, highlighting the complex interplay of factors that can lead to such violent outcomes. The investigation into the shooting revealed that Reyes was a victim of bullying and suffered from depression. Just days before the incident, Reyes had been prescribed Prozac after telling a psychotherapist about the bullying he faced at school, where he was mocked and mistreated by classmates. The police investigation found that the bullying did not rise to the level to merit bullying charges, despite the significant impact it had on Reyes's well-being. Michael Lansbury, the teacher who lost his life, was remembered for his heroic attempt to talk Reyes into surrendering the weapon, thus giving other students a chance to flee. Lansbury was honored for his selfless actions and remembered as a devoted teacher who chose to work at one of the Reno area's highest poverty middle schools because he felt those children needed him the most. He was awarded full military honors, including a 21-gun salute, at his memorial service. In response to the shooting, discussions about gun control and the influence of violent video games and American culture were reignited. The incident was cited by Hillary Clinton during her 2015 presidential campaign as part of her advocacy for gun control. The Sparks Middle School shooting serves as a somber reminder of the importance of addressing bullying and mental health issues in schools, 
as well as the need for thoughtful discussions on gun control policies to prevent similar tragedies in the future. The Heidelberg University shooting, which took place on January 24, 2022, involved an 18-year-old biology student identified as Nikolai G opening fire in a lecture hall, resulting in the death of another student and injuring three others before he took his own life. The incident left the university and the broader community in shock, prompting discussions about campus security, mental health, and gun control in Germany. Nikolai G, originally from the Wilmersdorf borough of Berlin and residing in Mannheim, was reported to have had no previous criminal record, but was involved in a fight in 2017. Despite being considered healthy, there were indications of past mental illness, including a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. Investigators pointed to his disorder as a key factor behind the shooting, suggesting that he felt extremely humiliated and fundamentally misunderstood during his first term at the university, leading to the tragic event. The exact motive could not be unequivocally determined, although revenge for perceived humiliation was considered a possible motive. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and other officials expressed their condolences and shock over the incident. The university and the city held a memorial service for the victim, emphasizing the profound impact of the tragedy on the student community and highlighting the need for supportive measures for students' mental health. This incident underlines the complexity of factors leading to such tragic events, including mental health issues, the challenge of diagnosing and treating disorders like NPD, and the importance of campus security and gun control measures. It also reflects the ongoing global challenge of preventing violence in educational settings and the critical need for a comprehensive approach that includes mental health support, responsible gun ownership, and community awareness. On May 28, 1975, at 11.35 a.m., a tragic event unfolded at Brampton Centennial Secondary School in Brampton, Ontario, Canada, when 16-year-old student Michael Slobodian initiated a school shooting. The school subsequently shut down for the rest of the week and reopened the next Monday. Prior to the shooting, Slobodian had been absent from classes, leading teacher Margaret Wright to contact his parents. Upon being confronted by his mother during a break, Slobodian left a note for his family, declaring his intent to kill Wright, physics teacher Ross Bronson, who had rejected one of Slobodian's science fair projects, and any other sucker who gets in my way before committing suicide. Armed with two rifles concealed in a guitar case, Slobodian first targeted three boys in a washroom, resulting in the death of John Slinger and injuries to the others. He continued his rampage through the hallway, injuring several more students before entering an art classroom where he fatally shot Wright and wounded two additional students. Slobodian concluded his attack by taking his own life in the hallway near the art classroom. The incident left three people dead, including Slobodian, and 13 others wounded. Among the witnesses to the horrific events were Kathy and Nancy Davis, daughters of the Ontario Premier at the time, William Davis, and Scott Thompson, later known for his role in The Kids in the Hall. Thompson, who shared an English class with Slobodian taught by Wright, remembered her as his favorite teacher who first encouraged his writing aspirations. Wright was six months pregnant at the time of her death. Excitement over the start of the Winter Olympics in Russia, just days from now, turned to terror. A lone gunman who opened fire in a lecture hall at Heidelberg University in southwest Germany has injured four people. The assistant principal of a Nebraska high school has died after being shot by a student. The Reynolds High School shooting in Oregon on June 10, 2014, was a tragic event that ended with the loss of 14-year-old freshman Emilio Hoffman and the shooter, 15-year-old Jared Michael Paget, taking his own life. The shooting occurred in the school's locker room where Paget, armed with an AR-15, a handgun, and a knife, initially targeted Hoffman. The event unfolded during the morning period on the second to last day of the school year, causing profound shock and grief within the community. Paget, who was a member of the Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps and aspired to a career in the United States Armed Forces, managed to bring the weapons from his family's secured home to the school. The incident, which also resulted in non-life-threatening injuries to a physical education teacher, led to a significant police and SWAT response with students evacuated to a nearby store. The response to the shooting was multifaceted. Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber and President Barack Obama expressed their condolences and concern, with Obama noting the unique frequency of such incidents in the United States and calling for a shift in public opinion towards greater gun control measures. The community held a vigil for Hoffman, 
highlighting the widespread impact of the tragedy. In the aftermath, the Reynolds School District proposed a bond resolution to enhance security across its schools, including the remodeling of Reynolds High School to ensure a safer and more secure environment for students and staff. This event marked the first fatal school shooting in Oregon since the Thurston High School shooting in 1998, underlining the continuing challenge of ensuring safety in educational settings. The OAED Vocational College shooting on April 10, 2009, in Agios Ioannis Renti, Athens, Greece, marks a rare incident of school shooting in the country. Dimitris Patmanidis, a 19-year-old student of car electronics, armed with two converted pistols and a knife, opened fire at the college, shooting one student and two civilians before taking his own life in a nearby park. The attack left three injured, including the 18-year-old student Dimitris Kokonis, who was seriously wounded but survived after prolonged surgery. Patmanidis' motives appear to have been driven by experiences of bullying, leading to a planned act of revenge as suggested by the note found in his possession and his online activities prior to the incident. This tragic event underscores the critical importance of addressing bullying and mental health issues within educational environments to prevent such acts of violence. The aftermath of the shooting prompted a response from the OAED administration, sending a group of psychologists to support the college's students, highlighting the community's effort to heal and address the psychological impacts of such an event. This incident remains the only school shooting to have occurred in Greece, making it a significant case for studying the impacts of school violence and the importance of preventive measures. The Freeman High School shooting on September 13, 2017, is a harrowing event that significantly impacted the community in Spokane, Washington. The assailant, 15-year-old sophomore Caleb Sharp, armed with an AR-15 rifle and a Colt 1903 pistol, opened fire at the school, resulting in the death of one student, Sam Strahan, who confronted him, and injuries to three other students, Emma Nees, Jordan Goldsmith, and Gracie Jensen. The incident unfolded in a span of just five minutes, with Sharp being detained by school staff shortly after the shooting began. The school, part of the Freeman School District, is located north of Rockford and approximately 19 miles southwest of Spokane. It offers a range of athletic programs and has a student body demographic that reflects the broader rural community it serves. The events of that day and the subsequent legal proceedings, including Sharp's sentencing to 40 years to life in prison in 2022, underscore the devastating effects of school shootings on victims, families, and communities. Victims and their families shared their experiences and the lasting trauma they've endured during the sentencing hearings. Sharp's apology to the community, while acknowledging his actions and their irreversible impact, came as part of these proceedings. This tragedy highlights the critical issues surrounding school safety, the importance of timely intervention for individuals showing signs of distress or threatening behavior, and the long-term effects on survivors and the community at large. The quick response by school staff and students during the shooting likely prevented further loss of life and highlights the importance of preparedness and training in emergency situations. The Millard South High School shooting in 2011 is a tragic event in the school's history, where senior Robert Butler Jr. attacked the school following his suspension, leading to the death of assistant principal Vicki Casper and Butler's own suicide. The incident, marked by its sudden violence and the use of a stolen firearm, resulted in additional injuries and a significant impact on the school and wider community. This event is recorded as the deadliest school shooting in Nebraska's history and highlights critical concerns around school safety and the well-being of students and staff. The Edmund Burke School, located in Washington, D.C., experienced a harrowing event on April 22, 2022, when a gunman, identified as 23-year-old Raymond Spencer, carried out a sniper-style shooting from the fifth floor of an adjacent apartment building. The shooter was equipped with four rifles modified for fully automatic fire, mounted with scopes, two handguns, and had more than 1,000 rounds of ammunition. Spencer fired at least 239 shots toward the school and other nearby buildings, breaking glass in the school and wounding four people. During the attack, he also posted a video of the shooting on 4chan and edited the school's Wikipedia page to report the incident. The police found Spencer dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound approximately five hours later in the apartment from which he had fired the shots. The incident left the upscale Van Ness neighborhood, where the Edmund Burke School is located, in a state of paralysis. The school, a private college preparatory academy, 
was about to dismiss its students for the day when the shooting began. The surrounding area was placed under a security lockdown, causing distress among students and parents. The police seized more than half a dozen firearms and large amounts of ammunition from Spencer's apartment, which had been arranged in a sniper-type setup. Despite the extensive preparations visible in the apartment, including a tripod weapons mount, the motive behind Spencer's actions remained unclear. The police chief described the gunman's intent as aiming to kill and hurt members of our community, with the victims being shot at random while going about their daily activities. This tragic event underscores the broader issue of gun violence in the United States, leaving a lasting impact on the community and raising questions about security and safety in public spaces. The Edmund Burke School itself is a small but vibrant educational community, enrolling approximately 225 high school students and 90 middle school students, representing a diverse demographic. The school, which emphasizes a low student-to-teacher ratio and offers a wide range of facilities, including a black box theater, gym, library, and various studios, aims to provide a comprehensive education to its students. It also competes in the Potomac Valley Athletic Conference, offering various sports with a no-cut policy to encourage participation. The April 22 shooting event, however, casts a shadow over the school's efforts to create a safe and nurturing environment for learning and growth, highlighting the urgent need for effective measures to protect educational institutions from such threats. The Great Mills High School shooting on March 20, 2018, resulted in the tragic death of 16-year-old student Jalen Willey and left two other students injured. The shooter, 17-year-old Austin Rollins, who was also a student at the school, opened fire with a 9mm Glock handgun in a school hallway. Rollins had been in a previous relationship with Willie, which highlights the personal nature of the incident. The situation was rapidly contained when school resource officer Blaine Gaskell confronted Rollins, leading to an exchange of gunfire. Rollins was later determined to have died from a self-inflicted gunshot to the head. The quick response of Officer Gaskell, who was trained in special weapons and tactics, was praised for preventing further loss of life. This event occurred in a national context of increasing concern over school shootings, coming just a month after the Parkland, Florida high school massacre that claimed 17 lives. Despite the quick containment of the situation and the limited number of casualties, the impact on the Great Mills community was profound. Survivors and the community grappled with the trauma and the complexities of categorizing such violent acts. The narrative around the shooting, as recounted by a survivor, Molly Davis, reflects the struggle with the broader societal reactions to school shootings, where incidents with fewer casualties can be overshadowed by those with higher death tolls. Yet, the trauma and the calls for action on gun control persist regardless of the scale. The weapon used by Rollins was legally owned by his father, highlighting issues around gun access and ownership laws. In Maryland, a person must be 21 to possess a handgun, raising questions about how Rollins obtained the weapon. The incident fueled discussions on the need for legislative action to prevent such tragedies, emphasizing the importance of background checks, secure weapon storage, and the role of school resource officers in maintaining safety. Great Mills High School, located in St. Mary's County, Maryland, is part of a community that continues to deal with the aftermath of the shooting. The school's response, including the presence of a trained school resource officer, is an example of the measures taken by educational institutions to protect students. However, the event underscores the ongoing national debate on how to effectively prevent school shootings, balance gun rights with safety concerns, and address the underlying issues that lead to such acts of violence. The Spanaway Junior High School shooting on November 26, 1985 is a tragic example of school violence that left a profound impact on the community and the nation. This incident involved 14-year-old Heather Smith, who, armed with a 22 caliber rifle, fatally shot two boys, including her ex-boyfriend, 15-year-old Gordon Pickett, and 14-year-old Christopher Rico, in the gymnasium at Spanaway Junior High School in Spanaway, Washington. Following the shooting, Smith fled the school grounds only to return later and, after a short standoff with police, tragically ended her own life. Heather Smith was born on February 5, 1971, and was 14 years old at the time of the incident. The attack targeted specific individuals and resulted in two fatalities, with no additional injuries reported. Smith's actions concluded with her death, marking a devastating end to a brief and violent episode that remains among the deadliest middle school shootings in the United States. The Spanaway Junior High School shooting is noted for its context within the broader issue of school violence, highlighting concerns over access to firearms by minors 
and the complex web of factors that can lead a young individual to commit such an act. It ranks as the third deadliest middle school shooting in the U.S. after subsequent incidents at Westside Middle School and Frontier Middle School. This incident, like others of its kind, underscores the necessity for continued dialogue and action on the subjects of gun control, mental health support for young people, and the safety of school environments. It also serves as a somber reminder of the potential for tragedy when personal conflicts escalate beyond control and the means for lethal violence are readily available. The Arapahoe High School shooting in 2013 triggered a comprehensive examination of the events leading up to the tragedy, revealing significant insights into school safety and threat assessment processes. An independent fact-finding report released by the Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence in January 2016 analyzed the circumstances surrounding the fatal shooting, aiming to identify lessons that could enhance youth violence prevention in schools across Colorado and the United States. The report emphasized the critical need for improved school safety protocols and threat assessment procedures. Key findings from the report and related analyses underscored several flaws in the school district's threat assessment process. These included a lack of professional knowledge and training among those responsible for initiating threat assessments, limited police response options listed on the assessment form, and the absence of a defined multidisciplinary threat assessment team at the school at the time of the incident. The assessors did not follow some procedures on the assessment and action plan form, and there was often no explanation for the rationale behind the decisions made during the assessment. In the aftermath of the shooting, discussions around school security and emergency preparedness highlighted the importance of comprehensive planning and response strategies to address various types of hazards and emergencies. Guy Grace, a director of security and emergency planning for Littleton Public Schools, shared insights on what went right and wrong during the Arapahoe High School incident. He emphasized the significance of being prepared for unexpected challenges and the crucial role that staff and student responses to lockdown drills played in preventing further casualties. The report and subsequent analyses also pointed to several areas of concern that had a direct impact on the event's outcome, such as the lack of formal disciplinary actions against the aggressor after making threats, outdated security camera systems, and inadequate lockdown planning approaches that resulted in confusion during the incident. Despite these challenges, the quick actions of school staff and students, as well as responding officers, were commended for thwarting the majority of the attacker's overall plan. The school shooting incident at Sapopemba State School in Sao Paulo, Brazil, occurred on the morning of October 23, 2023. The shooter, identified in social media circles as Lulu Zinho, was a 16-year-old male student who tragically killed one fellow student and injured three others, with two of the injuries resulting from gunfire. A fourth student sustained hand injuries while attempting to escape the scene. After the shooting, the assailant handed his revolver to a teacher and then surrendered to the police. This tragic event has highlighted several critical issues, including the impact of bullying and mental health among youths. Reports suggest that Lulu Zinho may have been a victim of bullying at school, which underscores the profound and lasting effects bullying can have on an individual's mental and emotional well-being. It's suggested that such experiences could have contributed to his unstable emotional state and the decision to carry out the attack. The aftermath of the shooting has left survivors, the school community, and society at large grappling with physical and emotional scars, as well as raised urgent questions about school safety and mental health support for young people. The incident has catalyzed discussions on the need to address bullying more effectively and to ensure that all students have access to necessary mental health support. In the wake of the tragedy, there has been a community and authority response focused on providing support to the victims and their families, investigating the circumstances of the attack, and identifying any contributing factors. This collective effort also involves addressing broader concerns about safety in educational institutions and the mental health of young people. The school shooting by Lulu Zinho, known on social media and reportedly active on platforms like TikTok before deleting his account, brings to light the intersection of online identities, real-world actions, and the spaces, like Liberdade in Sao Paulo, that can become focal points in the narratives of such tragic events. While specific details about his social media presence and activities in Liberdade were not detailed in the sources, the overarching narrative emphasizes the critical role of community, mental health awareness, and the need for systemic responses to bullying and violence in schools. The Parkway South Junior High School shooting in 1983 is a tragic event that has had lasting impacts on those involved 
and on broader discussions of school safety and violence. On January 20, 1983, 14-year-old David Lawler opened fire in a study hall at Parkway South Junior High School, located in St. Louis, Missouri, killing one student, Randy Coger, and wounding another, Greg Palmer, before turning the gun on himself and committing suicide. The incident was premeditated, as evidenced by a three-page suicide note found in Lawler's possession, indicating he had planned the attack and intended to end his own life as part of it. The note suggested Lawler was under significant pressure, and the attack was not impulsive but rather the result of careful planning. The shooting has been described by survivors and witnesses as a deeply traumatizing event, leading to long-term psychological effects such as post-traumatic stress disorder for those who lived through it. Despite the years that have passed, the Parkway South Junior High School shooting remains a poignant reminder of the potential for violence within educational settings and the profound consequences such incidents have on individuals and communities. It also underscores the importance of addressing mental health issues and the need for effective measures to prevent school violence. The aftermath of the shooting, including the community's response and the lasting trauma experienced by survivors like Greg Palmer, highlights the ongoing debate over school safety and the measures necessary to protect students. Palmer's recounting of the event years later, especially in the context of more recent school shootings, reflects a continued urgency in addressing these complex issues. The shooting is documented as part of a painful history of school violence in the United States, serving as a case study for understanding the dynamics of such tragedies, including the warning signs, the impact on survivors and families, and the broader societal implications. The Kungalv school shooting, which occurred on March 4, 1961, at Thorold School in central Kungalv, Västergötaland, Sweden, marks a significant event as it was the first reported school shooting in Sweden and one of the earliest in Europe. The incident resulted in the death of one individual, Per Håkan Altval, and injuries to six others. The attack was carried out by 17-year-old Ove Conry Andersen, who, during a school dance, began shooting randomly at the attendees. This tragic event unfolded late at night, around 11.30 p.m., creating a scene of chaos and panic among the students. Anderson was known for his interest in cowboy movies, and he later told police that he wanted to emulate the heroes he saw in films. This aspect of his motivation led to discussions on the impact of media violence on youth behavior, and prompted the first governmental proposal in Sweden to investigate the effects of media violence. Anderson was deemed mentally unbalanced, partially due to alcohol effects at the time of the shooting, and was sentenced to close psychiatric treatment. Despite the tragedy, it was reported that the mother of Per Håkan Altval reached out to Anderson's mother shortly after the incident and forgave her son's killer. Anderson later committed suicide on August 12, 2008. In response to the social unrest and intolerance that can lead to such tragic events, the Kungalv model was developed. This initiative involves teachers, social workers, and community youth workers working collaboratively to identify teenagers at risk of joining neo-Nazi gangs or engaging in antisocial behavior. The aim is to redirect these young people towards positive influences, helping to dismantle active extremist groups and gangs within the community. The Kungalv model has been replicated in 20 other Swedish cities, demonstrating its effectiveness as a strategy to counter extreme intolerance and promote tolerance among young people. The Kungalv school shooting serves as a poignant reminder of the potential consequences of unchecked social unrest and the importance of interventions like the Kungalv model in fostering a more inclusive and tolerant society. The school shooting incident in the state of Bahia, Brazil, involved a teenager who used his father's gun to launch an attack. This tragic event forms part of a disturbing trend in Brazil, where school shootings have become increasingly common, reflecting a broader issue of gun violence within the country. Unfortunately, the specific details of the Bahia incident, such as the motivations behind the attack or the aftermath for the community and families involved, are not directly available to the public. However, this incident is emblematic of a larger pattern of violence that has sparked national and international concern.